So thanks as always for uh, joining us and spend some of your valuable time to hopefully learn a little bit more about uh, what we've been up to. Uh, today I'm going to cover the next major version of Migration FX version 3.0. Uh, there's actually quite a lot to cover, so I might be uh, quite brief on a number of points in here, but uh, you can always kind of pause and revisit this uh, from the recording, etc., to uh, understand it in a bit more detail if need be. So the quick running order for today is we'll go over the usual house rules and uh, a little bit as usual about Unified FX. Um, the, the kind of what's new component, uh, so there's lots of bits in there, some are quite small, some very big. Um, <clears throat> anything from simpler ways to add a cluster with uh, automatic cluster setup, uh, some net new functionality, uh, which is generally beneficial, ability to save filters, uh, which we'll take you through and give you a demo of. Um, then the two main new features are migration profiles, uh, which is relatively complicated and very powerful. So it might take a, I've got a few slides in there to try my best to explain that. And uh, it isn't for everybody, you know, it's more an advanced use case uh, set of scenarios. But for anybody who's doing something a bit more unusual uh, from a migration point of view, uh, this should hopefully be very relevant. And then the, the last kind of bullet point I've got on that agenda list uh, just before the demo portion is PhoneFX. So this is the first time that we're actually making available our um, a, a net new product, uh, which is called PhoneFX. It will be available standalone um, later uh, in the year, uh, in December, as part of one of the events, we'll be launching it. Uh, but we've actually embedded it and included the, uh, it as a, on a trial basis within Migration FX version 3 as well. So we'll take you through what Phone FX uh, can do and how to set it up, etc. So usual house rules, <coughs> please remember to submit your questions uh, to the Q&A panel. Uh, it's myself and Mohammed on the session today, so uh, he can help with some of the questions that, if they come up. Um, and remember to submit it to all panelists, please. Uh, that'd be appreciated. Uh, the session has been recorded, so uh, if you want a copy of the recording, if you miss parts of it or you want to share it, uh, you can just email sales at unifiedfx.com for that link. Uh, in terms of uh, Unified FX, a uh, quick refresher for anybody who's maybe new to us. Uh, we have three main products. We have PhoneView, which is uh, incredibly powerful endpoint management, used to manage quite literally millions and millions of Cisco phones been out for a number of years. and used by a very wide range of uh, customers. We also have a wallboard application called Wallboard FX, which is something that was designed to be really simple, kind of self-install, self-upgrade, um, and very flexible. It's 100% browser-based, no plugins, etc. Currently, uh, it's just working with UCCX at the moment, but you know, pretty much everybody has some form of UCCX in most environments, so it's very relevant. And because of how we've architected it, it's got the fastest real-time updates technically possible. So uh, you kind of have to see it in action to appreciate it, and we have it for a free trial. Uh, you can just download it from the website as well to find out for yourself if you like it or not. And then finally, we we'll obviously have migration effects, which we're going to cover uh, in detail in this session. But one important point just to uh, elaborate on, um, migration effects has always been available for free as part of Cisco's trade-in program. Uh, that uh, original technology migration program has been retired and replaced with a new program called MIP, which is Migration Incentive Program. But the good news is Migration FX, uh, the, the promo component, has been carried forward into that new program. It actually means that because of how the new program works, there's actually now other ways to get access to Migration FX for free. I've got a bit of detail on that at the very end, but quickly. What that means is, it's not just that when you're trading in 100 old Cisco phones for uh, new handsets, you can actually trade in non-Cisco phones as part of a competitive trade-in and uh, also qualify, uh, as long as 100 or more, for a copy of Migration FX, which uh, can be particularly useful uh, from a TAPS perspective. That's that kind of provisioning of handsets. So if you've got your old Avaya phones that are uh, removing and replacing the Cisco phones. When you put out that new Cisco handset, you can just type in the extension number uh, where that user resides, where they had their Avaya handset, for example, and then we can pick up the bat imported profile, which is one step you have to do, but we take care of the deployment of that bat profile directly to that user completely dynamically. So again, it eliminates all that 
correlation of uh, associating phones with users uh, because it's all dynamically provisioned using that tap technique. So basically there's now two ways to get migration effects for free through the, MIP, the new MIP program. Uh, so in terms of the, uh, just a quick rundown of what's new, um, there's a lot of kind of small incremental things. Um, some subtle things that uh, really, uh, uh, in particular to the migration phone service is that we have had on occasion uh, some challenges with detecting the phone when you plug it in. Um, sometimes maybe the IP address information, we don't get that too quickly from communication manager, so it takes a little bit more time for it to discover it. Um, but we've actually added, this has been for a little while, but we had uh, we've fully qualified it now, uh, an extra parameter that you now add to the end of the, idle URL or whichever way you push the migration service out, uh, which is basically that name equals hash device name hash uh, query string argument. If you add that to the end of the migration service, uh, it's going to make it a lot more uh, consistent and stable for detecting phones, irrespective of what the IP address is, etc. So that's uh, <clears throat> a good improvement. Uh, we also uh, had a little thing that we missed, <laughs> bizarrely enough, which is uh, we've been using people for do, uh, using the kind of TAPS functionality and provisioning in particular back devices, maybe dummy uh, MAC addresses, things like that. They're actually flagged as uh, device active as false, so they don't use consumer license at that point. Uh, so what people were having to do was to manually, after they provisioned the phone, use the migration FX, change that flag. Uh, but we now do that automatically as part of the provisioning step. So when you <coughs> deploy a, a new Cisco phone, type in its extension number, and uh, we're basically, in this case, doing a provision scenario where we're taking it from a bat imported device, um, maybe because you've moved from a, a known Cisco phone system, uh, then we also flag that set device active at the same time. Uh, another little enhancement uh, based on customer feedback is the minimum extension length. So when you're doing the search by extension scenario, uh, we just had a hard-coded uh, minimum extension length of three previously, but now you can change that from the default, which is still three, to any length that you want. So if you've got a you know a dial plan which is typically five or seven digits, etc., that's quite good to put in there because it means that people can't do accidentally less digits than you really want them to. So you know minimizes fat finger trouble and uh, possibly identifying the wrong phone, etc. Uh, another enhancement uh, is something that we never really properly had was uh, suitable uh, password recovery. So if the admin user that you set up automation FX with got uh, the password out of sync somehow, maybe you overwrote it or something like that, uh, then effectively uh, you had to delete the data store and re-add the cluster. Uh, you don't need to do that anymore. Uh, we have a way to recover um, <clears throat> because what you can basically do is log into the Automation FX admin interface, even if our account is invalid, password wrong, locked out, etc. Because we use your credentials, and as long as you've, in addition to the normal requirements, got AXL API access, we use your credentials if ours, uh, the admin user fails to then connect to UCM using your credentials, validate your permissions, etc., based on our rules, and assuming that all checks out, then you can log in. So even if our automation FX admin users locked out, so to speak, or the passwords going out of sync, then you can always log in, basically, and then just reset the admin user password accordingly. So relatively simple thing, but uh, just saves about a hassle. Uh, next enhancement is uh, HTTPS support. Uh, oh, just one point, we will be handling questions at the end, but feel free to submit them at any point during the session. And uh, what I'll try to do, if they're relevant during the session, I'll jump in top of them and uh, do a quick reply, but um, I'll try to save some time near the end. Another point is there is quite a lot of content in here. I'm trying to rattle through it as quickly as I can. There is a quite likely it's going to overrun. Uh, so uh, if, if it does and you can hang on, fantastic. But that's one of the reasons why we're recording it, just so we can capture all that. So, But we'll, we'll at least make sure we've got all the questions answered at the end if we can. Uh, so HTS support, uh, again, it's something that's maybe not used too often. <clears throat> but uh, we have had customers that have required, uh, asked for it uh, because, you know, the nature of the environment security uh, requirements. Because, you know, a lot of people aren't too happy enabling the phone's web server for a number of reasons. Uh, it, maybe they do it temporarily as part of the project so they can use the zero touch functionality. You know, it's, it's not mandatory to enable the phone's web server. You can still migrate using other techniques, but um, obviously zero touch is the simplest. 
that even if they are enabling it, some customers like the idea of they're able to ensure that it's uh, encrypted. So we can now do that. Uh, there's a use HPS setting against each cluster you can uh, turn on. It's under the advanced mode. And But because obviously some of the really old phone models don't support HPS, um, what we do is we automatically fall back to use HTTP, because otherwise you just wouldn't get any topology data, and that would kind of defeat the purpose. Uh, so it's kind of smart enough that it can just grab the data as securely as technically possible. Uh, this particular feature uh, I'm really pleased with. It's a very technical thing in terms of what we had to do to get the inspiration and implement it. Uh, and the net benefit is, is pretty good, actually. So <clears throat> again, one of the things that we've always had a bit of a challenge with is when people uh, are plugging phones in and out quickly and you know keeping track of that registration state and things like that because the throttling of the APIs and communication manager are uh, can be a bit of a challenge especially when you've got really large phone quantities and you want to you know stay up to date with that data as uh, effectively as you can and that's part of the reason why we have two re two kind of update cycles we've got a refresh cycle which by default is every minute and a full update cycle which is every hour. So anything that we don't catch in the incremental refresh, the full update always gets for us. But what we've now been able to do is enhance the logic in the refresh to basically progressively work its way through the entire phone uh, list to refresh all that phone data, uh, you know, chunk by chunk, uh, minute by minute, uh, which means that even in a very large system, we'll most likely be able to actually refresh all the data before the update comes up. And some data we're going to refresh really, really quickly. And the way we've structured it is based on four priorities. So remember, this runs every minute. Uh, so first thing that we, uh, as part of that minute cycle we do, is we look to see if there's been any phones that have changed in the database. So a phone edit, you know, a new phone plugged in, like auto registration, that's the kind of thing that will trigger that. And they go to the top of this kind of refresh list that we have. So they'll always get handled first. Then secondly, we look at unregistered phones, but we don't take all the unregistered phones. We take a, a kind of chunk of them, typically about 500 at a time. And, uh, you know, obviously, if you don't have 500 registered phones, just take all the ones that you've got unregistered then, but maximum of 500 per chunk. Uh, and then we add that to the progressive refresh, and we look at those ones to see if they've changed state, et cetera. Then the next thing we look at is uh, dynamic data that's stimulated from the phones page. So this is quite an interesting thing we had a little while back, but didn't really tell anybody about, is that when you open up that phones page, it's actually a dynamic um, data that we pull. It's virtualized. So if you get 10,000 phones, we don't pull all 10,000 phones. We, pay, we pull a page at a time dynamically. And as you scroll up and down, we automatically choose the next page. But what happens is when any client requests that page of data, we take that 50 or 60 or whatever phones that have been uh, submitted as part of that request, and we add them into this refresh list uh, just underneath the registered one. So that's data coming from the phones page. So it means by looking at phones in the phones page, you're going to increase the likelihood that that data is going to refresh sooner, basically. So it means the page becomes more up to date automatically. And then finally, what we also do uh, at the end, ironically, is look at registered devices. We go on the basis that what this is really designed to do, as per the last bullet point there, is to make it significantly quicker to detect when a phone goes from an unregistered state to a registered state. So by looking at the unregistered state as a priority, then that means that it's going to quicker, it's going to be quicker to find a phone that transitions from unregistered to registered. It's longer in the opposite direction, but it's faster in the unregistered direction. And that's um, really, you know, one of the main purposes of uh, the way that migration FX works is to detect when those new phones get plugged in. So if you've got, if you've bat imported a whole chunk of devices, <clears throat> they will already be in Communication Manager, so we won't get a database change to stimulate us, to stimulate this mechanism. Um, if uh, you do plug that phone in, we don't really get any kind of notification, so that's why we need to refresh and try and find those unregistered phones when they change. Um, <clears throat> so therefore, by pr prioritizing uh, the kind of query against unregistered phones, then we'll find when that unregistered phone goes uh, registered quicker. So anyway, uh, it's a uh, bit of a long way of explanation, but it, it does make a huge difference in terms of being able to uh, detect uh, when phones come online because of how that algorithm works. So the next piece is uh, automatic cluster setup. So um, setting up automation FX is already 
quite straightforward by design, you know. Um, it's just basically create user account and call manager and give it a few permissions, etc. Um, so it's not too uh, too arduous a task to perform. But uh, here's the thing: uh, what, what we've actually added, uh, kind of platform level, is CTI capability. That's something that was never there before. And we're leveraging the same library that we've used within PhoneView. So basically, most of the functionality in PhoneView is effectively under the hood inside. Automation FX, and we'll be unlocking more of that in the future. And a part of that functionality, which we're now making available in uh, this version of uh, Migration FX, is remotely controlling phones. Uh, so that's that phone FX functionality on a single phone basis, which I'll uh, explain in more detail in a minute. But ultimately, we'll get more permissions that we require because of that CTI interaction and these kind of things. We also have a second user account that we now require, which is uh, for taking phone screenshots. It's quite important as a separate account, actually, the way we structure it. Um, so there's just more to configure. So what we decided to do was to make it even easier to set up, even though there's more uh, to uh, you know, plug in. And the way we do that is uh, when you now when you add a cluster, there's a screenshot in the top right corner there. Uh, what you get presented with is simply the name of the cluster and its IP address. Then you have a choice to make. Do you want to do an automatic setup, that's the left-hand button, or do you want to do it the previous way with a manual configuration and you know go and create the account yourself and you know follow the permissions that it's highlighted on the clusters page, etc. So you've got that choice to make. But obviously, so when you take the easier approach and you click the setup button, you then see this second screen grab here uh, with the automatic UCM setup. And what it asks for is a setup user and a setup user password. And this is basically a one-time account. We don't need, we won't keep a record of this. All it really needs is uh, the Excel API access. For example, uh, permissions via the standard TabSync users, a way to grant that. Uh, you know, and all admin level accounts will have that uh, type of permission anyway. So if I then put in that admin level account, uh, which has uh, database access into the setup user setup password, we temporarily uh, use that to go away and create the automation FX user, the UFX phone user dynamically, sign all the relevant permissions, et cetera and add your cluster uh, accordingly. So it just makes the, the setup experience a lot simpler. And what we'll actually suggest if you're migrating, uh, or, or I meant migrating migration FX, if you're upgrading uh, migration FX uh, from a previous version, uh, we generally recommend that it may actually be easier to just uh, delete the automation FX user. You might not have used that username, that's just in case you have used that same username format. If you delete that first, and then just re-add the cluster using the automatic setup, and it'll go away, create, and set up the, those accounts uh, for you. You don't have to do that if you want to do things manually, obviously. Uh, we're going to stop that, but you know, it just makes life uh, that a little bit easier. It's one of these things that we've put it in there so that for kind of new customers that our first trying at the software or new to what automation FX is uh, able to deliver them, uh, there's just less work and less uh, things that can go wrong when they're setting them up. So uh, on top of the automatic setup, which is get, which basically includes pretty much everything you would need really for migration FX to work and a few things for the, the new phone FX functionality uh, to work as well. For phone FX itself, there's actually two specific uh, requirements which you will have to take care of yourself. Uh, this is something we wouldn't want to automate, uh, to be absolutely honest. Uh, one of them is the enabling the phone's web server. Again, that's optional, not mandatory. You don't have to use the phone FX functionality, um, but uh, if you do want to use it, it does require the phone's web server to be enabled so we can take screenshots from it. It's also uh, phone's web server's been a requirement for the zero touch feature anyway, so there's a good chance you might already have it enabled anyway. And the next piece uh, for the screenshots to work in particular is we need a valid authentication URL. Now, in a default communication manager configuration, it usually just has the host name. You know, no, you know, uh, domain suffix or anything like that. Just a pure host name, so it won't typically resolve even if you've got DNS on your phones. So, therefore, you need to make sure you either you've got an IP address pointing to, say, the publisher, etc., uh, or the the full DNS resolvable host name. So just make sure your authentication URL, which you can set in the enterprise parameters page, is uh, set up correctly. Um, but actually, and that's one way you can do it. But actually, what we recommend is a new feature again that we've added is that Automation FX itself also has an authentication mechanism built into it. So what you can actually do is set the 
authentication URL and just keep the path component the same, CCM, CIP, Authenticate, GSP, etc. And just put in the IP address of your Automation FX server and the port number, which is default 8181. And what that will, ha will happen is uh, once you update your phones and they pick up that authentication URL, is whenever we go and talk to the phone's web server, it will point back to Automation FX, so therefore it will be able to validate the credentials because we sent them and we know them, obviously. Uh, and then that takes uh, Communication Manager out of the loop, so you don't even need to worry about device associations or anything like that. So there's basically two ways to authenticate. Um, and I'd say we recommend using Automation FX as an authentication server, but it's not mandatory either. <clears throat> and if you don't use uh, Automation FX, you just run with the usual authentication URL with uh, call manager, the uh, publisher usually performing the authentication function, uh, that will still also work automatically because if you've followed the automatic setup and therefore we've created this UFX phone user account for you, uh, we will dynamically associate phones as you interact with them. So once we pick a particular phone, open up to control it, uh, and we start taking screenshots, it will go away check if it's associated. If it's not, it will then associate it automatically. But what we have is a hard limit of 100 associations because it's you know, generally something we don't want to do automate too much, if you know what I mean, if there's any kind of limits or constraints on that that you want to consider. So it just means you can get up and running quickly, but there's a hard limit of 100 associations. And generally, we would recommend that you would, if you're using that feature in Anger, you would move towards the Automation FX Azure Authentication Mechanism. So really those two slides are just about how the setup side of it works. So we've automate, we've simplified to the automatic setup pretty much uh, everything with the uh, exception of those two components, which is Web Server Enabled and Authentication URL. And they're typically driven because of this new phone FX functionality. And again, it's all optional. You don't have to use this phone FX feature if you don't want to. Uh, okay, next uh, new feature is uh, filters. So you, if you're familiar with migration FX at all, then hopefully you would, and especially the you know version two, et cetera, um, you should hopefully be familiar with the, on the phones page, uh, when you've got a list of all the phones, you can search, etc. There's a little panel on the bottom left side which has a summary of all the key phone data, and uh, you can tick away in there and filter the list of phones in the table based on your filter criteria. It's the same mechanism that we have in PhoneView, but obviously a web-based format. But actually, what we're now adding is a feature that PhoneView actually doesn't have, which is the ability to save those filter criteria and uh, restore them, uh, save and use them, basically. So to do that, you basically choose your selections, you'll tick, tick, tick for whatever criteria that you want, and then inside that filter name component, uh, just above the, uh, the list of eight filter items, just start typing in a name, press enter to confirm. Uh, that, that will register uh, and create that filter entry uh, as soon as you click the little save icon. The little save icon will go red, you click save, and uh, it will save that filter. You can go away, make some changes, click save again to update that filter, or then go away, flip or create uh, yet another one. Um, you can uh, click the little edit icon and uh, delete it as well. I'm going to give you a quick demo of that in a little second anyway, so you'll see it in action. Um, what we've also added is both to that uh, summary uh, component, as well as the main phones table, are two useful pieces of information. One of them is the button templates that the phone has uh, assigned to it, as well as uh, details on any expansion modules. Uh, and this will become more relevant once I talk about migration profiles, why we added it. Uh, so one of them is the uh, button template uh, that's pulled straight from the device. You can see in that snapshot of the filter, it summarized them all there. Uh, one useful thing we do is we take all of those SEP MAC address individual templates and we group all them together. So rather than having maybe hundreds or even thousands of individual templates, they're all together under one category because there's no real benefit seeing all those individually. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we also, the expansion module information, we uh, kind of summarize that up and include the quantity of modules, that little star number, so star three, star two, et cetera, to tell you how many modules are uh, that particular phone would have if you filter on it, as you see that's in the table. So if you give me a little second, I'm just going to give you a little demo of the filters. So let me just share my browser. Okay, so we have the uh, phones page open, <coughs> excuse me. 
And uh, so I can see all my phones in the table there. And on the left-hand side, we have the summary of that data, which uh, hopefully some people might be familiar with. And the new component is this little filter name on top. So um, let's just show you some of the filters I've got. So I click on that, and it's a little drop-down list. So there's a, a demo filter, for example. So that's just me got a little category I've defined and status register, uh, things like that. But let, let's say I want to create a new filter. So obviously I've made an edit. I could save on top of this one. But uh, let's see, I've got registered phones. So I'll click in here. Oops, I click a capital at the beginning for some reason. So I hit enter, hit save. And then we can see I've got a register criteria. And just to prove that, if I flip over to another selection criteria, this one is uh, based on a button template on this occasion, flip back to registered, you can see that it's loaded up that appropriate one. So I can now easily jump between different sets of phones effectively based on a, a very flexible uh, filter mechanism. And that's really it. Uh, a little bit more detail if I want to edit the description. So let's say I go to that filter. Um, I click on the little edit icon there. My pop-up box comes up. I can change the name. I can just say, if I can type properly. Something like that, save. And uh, it's obviously captured that description. Um, now, filters are something that are quite foundational that we've, uh, we're going to use in lots of features moving forward in the Automation FX platform. So even though Technically, you don't really see a description anywhere at the moment, other than when you're editing it. It will be something that we'll use in other places, so it'll give you an ability to understand the content of a filter rather than just its name. Uh, you know, if you need to provide a little bit more detail, so that's why we have a description in the first place. And if I want to delete, I just use that delete button to remove it. Anyway, that, that's all I wanted to quickly show you on the filter side. So back to the slides. Um, Okay, so this is a bit where it gets uh, <laughs> a, bit, a bit more complicated. This is really advanced scenarios, so this won't necessarily be for everybody. Um, but you know, there might be something in here as I hopefully go uh, through it and explain it that uh, might relate to some situation, even if not now or in the past, but something that might be coming up in the future that it might be useful for. Now, normally whenever you migrate a phone uh, in Migration FX. We just kind of keep everything straightforward and simple. We just map all the buttons over, make sure everything gets copied, because that's the most important thing, you know, that consistency. Um, but there are some occasions where you want to do something as well as just a straight mapping, or you want to consolidate your button templates, you might want to include some, some configuration like the sidecars. You might want to uh, control those mappings specifically, you know, that whole kind of six buttons to five button kind of scenario if you're not using extended line mode. And then there's, uh, you know, maybe you're moving phones as part of uh, a migration, etc. So these are the kind of things that have been challenged with by customers to try and handle those kind of scenarios. So, and this is what migration profiles uh, allows us to, to solve effectively. And the way it solves it is a dynamic mapping of a phone template, that's the bulk admin tool uh, phone template configuration. It's a foundational part that's uh, required when you migrate any phone. That's Because uh, whenever you migrate a phone from one model to another, it has to have a phone template because if there's any properties or fields that don't exist on the old phone, maybe it's a different model, different protocol, things like that, the, it fills in the gap effectively based on the data from the phone template. So we always need a phone template anyway when we migrate, but we've effectively extended the phone template by ma mapping a one-to-one -one relationship between a migration profile and a phone template and having the ability to override certain properties from that phone template. And what I mean by that is whenever you're migrating, if you want to, uh, you can instead of taking settings from the old phone straight over to the new phone, you can actually instead override those values and copy them from the template instead of the old phone. So it's kind of like a merge operation. So rather than just filling in the, the gaps with the phone template for those you know, model or protocol specific settings, you can actually take maybe more foundational settings, things like device pool and uh, device calling set space, and uh, pull it from the phone template instead. As I say, this is advanced use cases, so it's not something you have to do every time. And technically, you don't have to create migration profiles. You don't have to use the feature at all. It's just an enhancement that allows you more flexibility. So the way that a migration profile works is uh, based on 
you know, matching that migration profile dynamically during a migration. Now, the screenshot on the right hand side there is, uh, is, is me showing what a migration profile looks like. Uh, it has a name component, and I'll, I'll show you this in the demo. It's got a name component, it's got the phone template that it's associated with, which is a corresponding model. It then can optionally have a filter and optionally set a priority. And I'll tell you what they're for in a little second. Um, and then down in the main panel there, we pull out the values from that phone template so you can preview what they look like. And then if you want to, you can then pull or effectively override values, those values from the phone template instead of just copying them from the old phone. So for example, if I do not tick the override button template, then if this migration profile is used, all the buttons from the old phone will be mapped over to the new phone. But if I wanted to, you know, consolidate, override, and choose a specific button template for a certain situation, I would then tick that box and it will use the button template that is configured against that phone template. And the same thing applies for any one of those fields. You don't have to tick any of them. You can just use the just use it as a way to map to a phone template and pick up the gap in terms of those protocol specific settings, etc. But this gives you a lot of flexibility. So the way that um, it, it kind of finds the migration profile to use is you can have as many of them as you want and uh, but the, what it will basically do is evaluate, first of all, um, when a migration happens, the new phone, its model, and obviously the cluster that it's on, because uh, the, sort of the platform supports multiple clusters, um, it will check that first. So if you've got two migration profiles for different you know, uh, phone templates with different models, only the one or ones that uh, match the model of the new handset will be uh, candidates, so to speak. And then the next thing it looks at is the filter. And this is the same filter I just showed you a minute ago, but this filter is what matches against the old phone. So that might be based on a device pool, so only phones from a certain uh, you know, location, or it could be based on a button template, etc. And effectively, this is how we join the old and new phone together with the migration profile in the middle. So the first criteria is the basically the model of the, the new handset, and then the second criteria is a, a, a filter which we evaluate against the old handset, and it allows you any permutation to, to match those two together. Now, if for any reason uh, you've got multiple migration profiles and both the new phone model is the same, and uh, there's an overlap with the filters, as in you know, you've got two profiles with two filters, and uh, uh, you know the device is inside both those filters, then we use a third criteria, which is a priority field. Uh, and generally, you know, to keep things simple, we would tell you to avoid using priority unless you absolutely have to, uh, because if you're careful and you make sure that your filters are not overlapping, then priority never becomes a, a factor, basically, and keeps it a little bit simpler. <clears throat> So generally in terms of migration profiles, it still works alongside all of the existing migration logic. So not many people have used this, but we actually have a naming convention that's been there since you know day one, uh, where if you have a particular MAC address and naming convention for a phone or a button template, we will use that phone or button template instead of dynamically generating one. Um, <clears throat> so that still applies. You can still use that functionality if there is no migration profile that matches. So that's something that's relevant. Um, the other thing that you can do, and this is something we added in version 2.0, is you could specify specific phone and button templates on each individual device. So you can go away, select five or six phones, click edit, specify a phone template, a button template if you wanted to, and uh, whenever that phone migrated, assuming that uh, you set the correct new phone model uh, against that template, then it would use that corresponding phone or button template. Uh, we've actually enhanced that interface a little bit, so there's now a little search feature there, so you don't have to type it in exactly correctly. You can just search and find the, the phone or button template, so it's a bit easier to use. However, we're actually trying to move away from that because of how flexible the migration profile feature is itself. It's effectively depreciating the need or for the naming convention or going down to individual device level and setting it. But they're still there, you know, uh, We'll, we'll kind of leave them there until people stop using it, basically, and then we can maybe remove it. But there's, there's no urgency on that, just to see where it rolls. Um, but remember, migration profiles are optional. This is just me telling you about additional functionality, not things you have to use, just things you can choose to use. Um, so I'll try and cover this as best I can, but basically, 
I've got a couple of scenarios that uh, are quite advanced and talk about how you can use migration profiles to solve these kind of problems. So for example, imagine um, you wanted to control your button template mapping. So maybe uh, you've got a bunch of managers and assistants, et cetera, who have you know uh, two line and four line configurations with so many, you know six buttons, et cetera, and you want to manage how they go to a five button configuration, where you drop a line or add a speed dial, that kind of stuff, uh, not just do a one to one mapping. Then what you can do is you could define a, a filter criteria that would go to the, match the old phone and look at the old phone's button template that you've assigned to those managers. So that would be a manager filter, so to speak, for that particular configuration. Uh, you could then map that via a migration profile to a corresponding phone template for the new model or models that those manager phones could be replaced with. And the appropriate, and you click the override button, uh, the override checkbox against the button template and that would mean take the button template on that phone template with our new manager configuration that we want to apply and that would line that through. So if you look at that table, it's kind of like a horizontal row where we're going from the old phone with that that matches that filter all the way through. If that model is uh, the same model as the new phone, then apply that button template. Um, and then what we've got is that bottom item there is no filter specified, so that would catch any old phone and all devices. Now it always evaluates filters first. So if a device matches a filter, it will always prioritize that one uh, before uh, anything that doesn't have a filter set. So it would only be if it's not a manager and not an assistant that the no filter would be relevant in this case. And as you can see in this particular scenario, we're basically mapping that to a standard two line piece by speed dial configuration. So not the most sophisticated example in the world, but just trying to demonstrate how you can map all of that out uh, if, if that's something that's important to you. Next scenario is something that's come up a couple of times now. Um, and you know, we like a challenge, we like it when people try to do something a little bit different and uh, you know, and rather than having to do some post processing work after, you know, our software has helped them to migrate the phone. Uh, we were looking at ways that we could uh, incorporate some of those uh, after migration updates as part of the migration flow effectively. And that's really what those overrides are there for. Uh, so in this case, imagine that you have, uh, <clears throat> as part of your uh, budget for, uh, you know, moving staff to a new office, new building, etc. You you've bought a bunch of new handsets. So you're kind of doing two things at once. You're re relocating your staff from one building to another, and you're uh, deploying new infrastructure and new equipment uh, as part of that move and allocating that cost accordingly. Uh, so really, you probably end up with a situation you've got a dual running environment with minimal disruption. You go away, deploy all the new equipment first. Once that's all proven out and uh, finalized, then staff are free to move whichever format you want them to do that. Um, so that's come up a couple of times now. Um, and generally, you obviously use migration effects to do that. You can deploy the new handset, type in uh, on the user's desk, type in the extension number that the user is going to appear there. That will basically <clears throat> make a copy of their phone it will leave the old phone in place, assuming they don't have an intercom line, obviously. We can't, you can't do shared configurations with intercom, so that, that wouldn't apply. But assuming there's no intercom to confuse matters, uh, you would basically have a copy of that user's phone, so whenever they do move over, you know, they're, they're, they're up and running. But there are occasions, obviously, where that site might need to go to a different gateway or have some site-specific settings like device pool and device CSS. Uh, so that's something you can now do. Uh, so imagine you had a filter to match all the phones that are in the old location, so they're only relevant to the phones that are moving. Then you create a, a set of phone templates for the new models uh, for the, the new location. And as part of the configuration, you would tick overrides on the, the particular properties of those phone templates for that site that you want to pull in, which is say device pool CSS, obviously. You might, for example, not override the button templates and just copies all the buttons over. You could obviously incorporate that uh, button template change as well if you felt like it. Uh, and then that gets tied in using the migration profile that associates basically the filter and the phone template to, to link the two together. And that means that you deploy the new 8865, for example, uh, site B, type in an extension number uh, for the user's phone, so we get matches uh, a phone that's in site A, uh, that migration profile will be engaged, and when it migrates the phone configuration over, it will actually take the device pool and device CSS for site B based on the phone template instead of just copying it from the original phone from site A. So, say, not something that happens very often, but 
you know, we've designed this uh, migration uh, profile feature just to give you this level of flexibility. And then final scenario is consolidation. Uh, so imagine uh, you have a situation where you've got a lot of individual button templates or just a whole bunch of different templates that you want to reduce down. Um, this particular example, you could basically create a filter that uh, matches all the individual button templates. And remember that new feature that we added, the ability to filter by button templates. We actually summarize all those individual button templates in one. So it basically one tick box would be able to group all them together into a single filter. And that would be like a big catch-all. So anybody that has got an individual template, you could then consolidate that together, map that through if they get a new 8865, so a corresponding 8865 with a standard one line for speed dial configuration. But what you can also do is if you've maybe got managers who you want a slightly different button configuration, um, then you could have uh, a different filter. Now in this case, Effectively, you could have a potential for an overlapping filter because you might have a manager who also has an individual button template. Uh, now, if that was the case, then priority comes into effect. So that means if the person sits in the middle, they're both an individual button template and a manager, then uh, it would use the manager 8865 migration profile because it has a higher priority, and that would mean that we get the corresponding manager button template. As I say, uh, just examples of how to use this. Uh, you know, in reality, uh, I think it's going to take a bit of time for people to, to probably think through the, the best application of this feature, but the way it's designed, it, it will cover effectively any situation. Uh, okay, so nearing the end of the slide deck portion, uh, the demo's come up shortly. Uh, so the last main thing is this brand new uh, functionality that you're now going to be able to access on a trial basis as part of Migration FX is phone FX. Now, we call it the ultimate single phone control. You know, it may be a bit arrogant saying that, I don't dispute that, um, but we did put a lot of thought into how this works to, to make it incre uh, incredibly effective. Uh, part of that is we've managed to obtain desktop level responsiveness, but built into a web application. So you get the benefit of both worlds. You get the uh, interaction that you get from a desktop application, the speed of screenshots and button presses and CPI and all those kind of good things that we have in phone view but we deliver it in a flexible, accessible format because it's in a browser. So therefore, uh, it's now platform independent, access it from anywhere, obviously. I'm on a Mac right now, and we're going to demo it from a Mac, obviously. And, uh, you know, Automation FX is still a Windows application, so obviously the server component is still Windows, but at least the accessibility to be able to control phones you can do from anywhere now using this feature. Um, so it leverages the HTML5 functionality, the way we've designed it, the URLs are device specific, so you can bookmark them and jump back to the same device. You may have four or five test devices, you always go back to at any point in time. Uh, and say it's uh, sitting alongside Migration FX, so in the same Automation FX platform. We've actually designed it so it integrates automatically with PhoneView. Uh, so we've just published PhoneView 5.1 this morning. We released it as a beta uh, two weeks ago, but we've now uh, made it the default download today. So you can now get PhoneView 5.1. You can take this version of Migration FX, which I'll give you the download link for in a minute, and the Phone FX feature will now work automatically with that new version of uh, PhoneView, which basically means from PhoneView's perspective, you can have multiple phones in there, interact with them in bulk as you would normally do. But if you want to kind of spawn an individual uh, device out, you can just right click control and it'll open up that web page with the uh, uh, phone FX interface in there. Um, and it's nice and flexible way of designed it. And there's a bunch uh, more functionality we'll be including along uh, into phone FX over the next year. So we're only just getting started in that this respect. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff within phone view that we can start to expose. But what I would say is we're designing phone FX to be a single user help desk uh, kind of use case is its priority. The kind of bulk operations and things that phone views uh, particularly strong in is not going to be a focus. So you'll still, the two will basically work together effectively. So it's something that phone view has never been the best for is help desk scenarios. You can certainly restrict it and it can certainly be used in that situation. But phone FX from day zero is designed to fill that space uh, a, lot, a lot better, basically. Okay, so enough uh, chit chat on the slides. So Let's uh, jump into about a, a demo. Now, how are we doing for time? I get 10 minutes. I'm going to keep this as brief as I can. Uh, I haven't really been looking at questions. There's a couple, uh, so I don't think that will take too long. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's get my bearings. So, 
let's go to the phones page. So I think I'll show you phone ethics first, uh, actually, if I, I've got that kind of ready. So if I just go to my filters here, I've got some demo phones uh, set up already. And uh, <clears throat> all you have to do uh, to launch phone ethics is from the phones page, tick the particular phone that you want to control, and then click the control button, and that launches it. I had that one open already, actually. Go to the second one, click Control, and it launches it as well. Yeah, I think I already had them open. Let me just bring them both up at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so there we are. So that is a browser instance. Uh, we've tried to make it, you know, reasonably uh, familiar uh, to the, the layout and structure of the actual physical uh, handset itself. We didn't think it was really appropriate to look identical to a phone as some of the tools and products that we've seen uh, done in the past, because that adds a lot of extra space and uh, you know desktop space, etc. Kind of, in our opinion, unnecessarily. But we've designed it to be as familiar as possible. So you know anybody who has ever seen you know the appropriate Cisco phone and phone models should be very familiar looking at this interface for which button uh, goes where, etc. So I'm not going to do much other than just a simple call. So if I just go to the phone on the left and uh, just plug away and type in the extension number of the phone on the right hand side, click the dial saw key. You might be able to hear the phone, it's across the other desk there. <coughs> Excuse me. So you see the call coming in, uh, just click answer. And dead simple. Uh, so obviously we could do anything else we want from there, transfer the call, hold, etc. Um <coughs> do a conference and uh, all those kind of good things. But the, the point is we're giving you a nice familiar and easy to access way to remotely control a phone. And over time, uh, we'll get a whole bunch of extra features we're going to layer in uh, to this interface. Uh, but we're just starting with uh, the, the foundational requirements, which is really just you know, remotely controlled for But there's a bunch of other stuff we'll be adding in shortly. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, just hang up. But that gives you an idea of how that one works. Uh, let's now talk about the migration profiles. Now, I've actually created a few filters, so I'm just going to describe some of them. So I've got a man two manager kind of filters here, just different ways to tag a manager, so to speak. So I've got this manager tag, quite literally. Um, and what that is, that's using the category feature. So if I go to that phone and I click edit, there's this category name here, and I can select multiple devices at once and then uh, bulk update them too. Uh, and that gets me the manager category, uh, the category, and I've just put that person in the manager category there. And then that category automatically appears here, and we can just tick and group all those together. So that's kind of going down to the specific de device level. That's one way you could uh, identify groups of phones and users, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, manually rather than, you know, using the information that's already there. Uh, another way to do it, and this is a new way, uh, would be using things like a button template. So I've got this manager BP, so if I click that. So in this case, I've got uh, maybe even the same phone, actually, now I think about it. Uh, I've got this device here, which uh, has uh, this particular button template. And just to prove that, if I open up the columns and I add in button template, you can see there's a button template field, and it's got the current button template. Now, the reason why I've done this particular example is this is something that we can use as part of our migration profile if we wish. So if I go to the, this new page here, so it's underneath the migration menu, click the profile page. <clears throat> so here are the migration profiles. As I say, you don't have to create these. This default logic will apply. This is just extra ability to override the behavior. Uh, so in this case, for example, I've got this manager profile. I'll just click edit to show you the content of it. Uh, in this case, uh, this will match if a phone goes to uh, the new handset is a 8865, and the old phone has that manager uh, button template, which is a little filter in this case. I can just click that and choose any filter I want in there. I can also choose that top item, which is no filter, so it matches everybody, obviously. Um, I can just type in a priority number if I do have overlapping filters. That helps to decide which uh, migration profile wins, so to speak. Um, and then these are the overrides uh, that are, we've currently got available. And for anybody who you know finds this functionality of use, 
please uh, give us feedback on, you know, if there's any overrides at the device level that we've not included in this list, uh, it's really easy for us to add them. So, you know, we'll just put a, an initial set in there, but, uh, you know, feel free to make some suggestions. Uh, we thought the main ones would really be button template, device pool and device CSS. I can't imagine anybody actually needing to override the description that you can remove that at some point. But uh, as I say, it just gives you ways to uh, copy data from the phone template instead of the old phone effectively. Uh, and another migration profile that we have, just as an example, is this one to show you how you can use it to be a bit more specific for sidecars. So <clears throat> if I go to edit here and uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so I've created a phone template, which is for an 8861, and it's got some sidecars on it, I suspect. Um, now, for the moment, this has got no filter, so that would mean everybody migrating to an 8861 would get this phone template. But what I would probably in reality want to do is choose this filter that I created, which filters the phones that have expansion modules. I'll show you that filter in a second. So that basically means anybody who currently has an expansion module um, that's going to an 8861 will pick up this particular migration profile. And that means that because, it doesn't show it in the overrides, but it's something we always override, is because uh, that phone template has some sidecars on it, they will get copied over to the, the new handset. Uh, let me just quickly show you that expansion module filter. So I'll jump back to the phones page, go down to here, choose the expansion module filter, open this up and then you can see because we've summarized the expansion modules we've got them all ticked in here and that means that <clears throat> uh, any old phone with an expansion module would match that particular profile when it's migrating. Okay I think that's it for the demo portion let me jump back to the slides just to cover the last few points and uh, handle the questions. So the uh, I'm maybe going to show these other slides first and leave the questions to the very end so let me just move forward a little second. Just a quick reminder uh, about uh, the Cisco promotion, which I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so you can get the software for free, including the uh, trial level functionality of Phone FX2. Uh, if you do trade in 100 or more phones, either old Cisco phones or a competitive trade in for non Cisco phones as well. And uh, just when you do that migration center program submission, make sure you include the <coughs> promo code uh, L-CD-MGFX-PROMO, just rolls off the tongue, uh, to your uh, MIP uh, submission. And uh, as long as you've got over 100 phones, that should get approved and uh, you'll get your pack code, etc., for our software. Um, just a reminder, and hopefully most people have probably either registered or aware of them, uh, is that if you go back to the events page, uh, we've got a whole product launch schedule we've been running through for the last little while, so we've got the next few updates coming up, uh, which is uh, more about FX next week, a little bit of a gap uh, to get some breather, breath back, uh, and uh, then we're on to one of our biggest launches, which will be PhoneView version 6, a ton of work's going into getting prepared for that one, and uh, then in December we'll be launching the phone FX functionality standalone basically so you won't it won't be something that's uh, embedded within phone view or migration fx so you'll be able to purchase uh, separately um, so we kind of see that as a mid-tier component uh, that uh, if you don't need all the functionality of phone view you just want some relatively straightforward and useful single phone control you'll be able to buy phone fx uh, and uh, its corresponding notification notification FX functionality. So that's uh, due for launch on 6th December. And uh, we've got something which we've explained to a few people over the last year or so uh, that we're first thing we're going to publicly kind of share some details on it, which is uh, net new, which is automation FX itself, uh, the platform. Uh, we've uh, exposed the, the APIs that it uses uh, public, or we're going to start exposing them publicly so other people can develop applications against communication manager uh, and a very simple way that means you don't need to know how JTAPI works and all that kind of complicated stuff or even, you know, the EXL API. Uh, we take care of all of that and, um, and provide it for you. So it's kind of following the whole DevOps and, you know, application uh, enablement uh, trend that's uh, been happening through Cisco Spark. So we've got our own solution to uh, and our call managers to follow that pattern. So I think uh, that's mostly it. As I say, I'm just going to cover the Q&A in a little second. I'll leave this slide open whilst I'm going through them. Uh, but yep, just a reminder, uh, you can register the events. Uh, 
It's a free upgrade. If you've got a valid license key, you can just use that download link there. We're currently publishing the 3.0 release as a beta download. Uh, I think we did publish it automatically. I'll double check that after the session, but if it doesn't work at the moment, uh, and give you a 3.0 version, it certainly will in the next uh, half an hour. Um, and uh, you can just install it on top of the existing version, and uh, the existing license key will just be maintained and, and work automatically, obviously, assuming it's still valid. We'll probably wait a week or two, maybe three or four weeks, so see how it goes, and then we'll just make the T.0 the, the default download, but for people who attend this session, uh, they can get early access to the, the, that beta link. Okay, uh, I appreciate everybody hanging on so far. That is, is on the hour, and looks like most people are still here. So I'm just going to uh, go to the <coughs> Q&A uh, panel and uh, see, see what we've got in here. <clears throat> do, 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 do. So uh, let me just read through new phones through Cisco. Uh, yep, it's maybe been answered, but I'll just reiterate some of these. Uh, but uh, you can get migration FX out with the Cisco promo. You can buy it just as straight part codes of Cisco's GPL, uh, or you can purchase it directly from ourselves or you know anybody who we, we do resell through. Uh, so yeah, you, you don't you don't have to get it through the promo code, basically. We take money in different uh, forms, uh, so that's no issue there. Always happy to trade. <clears throat> um, okay, I think that's questions related. Uh, asking for the slides available for download. Uh, we don't usually publish our slides. You know, they're a little bit confidential, some of the information. We, we kind of prefer it in context with the webinar, so we'll just be the recording we'll probably publish. We usually put that up on uh, YouTube once we download and convert it, so that shouldn't take us too long. But you know, I'm going to stop the recording because this isn't really beneficial to anybody.